Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're out at the range to answer a question that we asked over on Instagram. We asked the question, if you were to pick an infantry rifle, given two choices, which one would you choose? And the two choices were the USM-14 service rifle or the FAL or one of its variants. Both of these rifles chamber the 7.62x51 NATO and I understand that 308 and 7.62x51 NATO aren't loaded to the same pressures, but for the sake of brevity, because of my propensity to misspeak, I'm going to simply call these rifles 308 in this video. But yes, I understand the differences between the two loads. So let's go ahead and do some shooting with these two rifles, talk about what I like and dislike about each of the guns, and then at the end, tell you which one I personally would have chosen. Now, the discussion over on Instagram was pretty spirited and quite fun to read, and hopefully the comments section of this video will also be fun to read and quite spirited. So let's get started, guys. In 1959, the U.S. government moved to adopt the M14 as its primary infantry service rifle. As I already mentioned in the opening of the video, the rifle does chamber the 7.62x51 NATO, which we're just going to call 308 in this video for the sake of brevity. But anyway, the rifle, it's, it's hard to say why the rifle was adopted. Now, there's a great backstory here how basically the United States screwed over our NATO allies in adopting the 308 rifle. But I'll leave that to somebody like Small Arms Solutions has a great video out there that talks about all the details of what went on behind the scenes that culminated in us adopting this and our allies adopting a different service rifle. But the M14 is very reminiscent of the rifle that preceded it in military service in the United States, which was the M1 Grand. Now keep in mind that you know the rifle was referred to as the greatest battle implement ever devised, speaking of the M1 Grand. So, in Americans' hearts, this rifle being related to the M1 Garand probably influenced the decision to adopt it. The rifle, the manual of arms for the rifle is gonna be very similar to the Garand that it replaced, so training troops would be fairly simple. But, you know, they lightened and shortened the rifle, shortened the receiver to accommodate the smaller 308 cartridge, updated the gas system, and a few other things. But let's talk about the M14 and some of its features. We'll start off on the rear of the rifle here. On the rear of the rifle, You'll notice it has a flip-up sheet metal butt plate. This is to be flipped up when firing in the prone, for example, to keep the rifle in the shooter's shoulder. Underneath the flippy thing that goes up, we have a trap door that houses a cleaning kit for the service rifle. Moving forward, we have a standard wrist stock on the gun. And I have the bolt locked to the rear. I'm gonna go ahead and let that go home. Just like the M1 Garand, it has a trigger with a safety right here in the front of the trigger guard. So when you put your finger in there, push forward, take it off safe, then pull back to fire. The weapon's now unsafe. Looking at the receiver, it looks very much like the M1 Garand. We have a sight system that's you know, taken basically straight from the Garand. We have the ability to adjust for windage and elevation. This one is equipped with a target rear aperture, but uh, the front sight is just a standard military front sight. Moving forward, we have a stripper clip guide on the left-hand side of the receiver, we have a manual bolt hold open device. So I'm gonna go ahead and depress that, pull the bolt to the rear and it will lock open. To release it, pull the charging handle to the rear and let it go. Moving forward, we have a drill and tapped hole right here on the left-hand side. And that's for using a detachable scope mount. The scope was set right over the top of the action. On the bottom, one of the big changes from the M1 Garand was the adoption of a 20 round box magazine that rock and locks in, making for much faster magazine changes or reloading. Moving forward, we have a rotating bolt and standard charging handle. Again, very reminiscent of the M1 Garand. Moving forward, we have a gas system that's been redesigned from the M1 Garand for the M14. Then out on the end of the barrel, we have a windage adjustable front sight and a very distinctive 
birdcage flash hider. Overall, the gun is a real pleasant rifle to shoot. It's a very fun gun to shoot, and it has something of a cult following here in the United States. So let's do a little shooting with this, and then let's talk about the FAL and some of the features it has. Loading the M14 service rifle is very easily accomplished by using the 20 round detachable box magazines. Going back to a day gone by, they also included the ability to use stripper clips if you have a empty 20 round magazine or one you want to top off already in the gun, you can take stripper clips out instead of charging the magazine, then putting it in the rifle, you can simply charge the magazine through the top of the action of the rifle. To load the rifle, first I'm just going to pull the bolt to the rear and lock it to the rear. You can also insert the magazine and just pull the bolt to the rear and let it go. It's a rock and locker, so you have a hole here in the front, so there's a tab inside the receiver that's part of the recoil spring mechanism that's going to grab the front of the magazine, then we'll lock in the rear. Insert the magazine all the way in, rock it back. Now, sometimes it takes a little bit of practice because you got to get that front toe of that magazine all the way up in the magazine well before you can rock it back. So you'll see some folks struggling with that. Then just pull the bolt to the handle to the rear, charging handle to the rear, let it go, and it chambers around. Now, I've already talked about the safety, which is kind of counter uh, intuitive these days because there's such an emphasis of keep, keeping the firing trigger finger off the trigger that it seems kind of awkward that you have to put your finger on the trigger to take the safety off. But at that point, in my mind, you're already committed to firing the rifle. We're going to go ahead and do some shooting at 250 yards here. Bring that front bag up a little bit. Now the trigger on these isn't, uh, isn't all that bad. And when firing from a rest like this, it's very easily, uh, you're very easily able to accidentally bump fire the rifle, which means you fire it. If you don't pin that trigger to the rear, it'll recoil into your shoulder. Then you'll naturally, your body mechanics will automatically push that rifle forward again, right into your trigger finger. So you have to be very careful when firing this. And even the FAL, I've, I've had problems with that at, at times if I don't pin that trigger to the rear. Flip the safety off and let's see, we got some pretty gnarly wind this afternoon. Let's see if I can figure out what my hold is for 250. Now we have camouflaged the 250 yard target to make it more difficult to hit with iron sights. Let's go ahead and try this hold and see what we get. Well, that seems to be the right hold. Oh. That wind's making my eyes water, which muddies the sight picture. All right, a very pleasant rifle to shoot. And even when firing at a man-sized target at 250 yards that's camouflaged, I can very easily score hits. In 1953, Belgium and FN Herstel would develop the FAL rifle. It was pretty much the brainchild of the lead designer, which would be Didonay Zave, who worked very closely with John Browning when John Browning was working on the Browning High Power and passed away. Uh, Didonay Zave continued that development and finished that pistol. He went on to work on this project as well. So you'll see that this rifle is more in line with what the Germans developed during the Second World War, and that would be the STG-44, which is a weapon they put into the field, but they had many other weapons that were, they were working on as well that were prototypes, but were pretty much in the same basic configuration as this rifle. And by that, I mean you have a pistol grip versus a wrist stock like on the M14. So let's take a look at some of the features of the FAL and just kind of work our way from the rear all the way forward. First of all, this is a fixed stocked model. There are many different variations of the rifle. We're just talking about this particular variation. Now we have a polymer stock, so the wood is gone, but there were wood stocked versions, but it's a, a fixed stock that's made out of polymer. 
They also offered the rifles with a, a side folding stock, which would be copied by other rifles later on. We have a pistol grip, and it's all polymer. And then on the rear, we have a windage adjustable peep aperture sight. It's called an aperture sight. It is adjustable for windage by loosening one screw and tightening the other, and that will drift the rear sight one way or the other. Elevation is, is adjusted with the front sight. Once you get it doped, you have a sliding elevation option. You just pinch and slide, and it'll click into its next elevation setting. On the left-hand side of the receiver, you'll see two different levers here that are close to each other. Uh, this lever is the disassembly lever, which in this case you push up, which breaks the action open. You will find other variations of the rifle where the lever is up here and you would pull it back to break the action open. This is the selector switch. That is safe. This is fire. And one more position would be full auto, but this one's pinned so it doesn't go to that position. Pretty much a standard arrangement for the trigger. On this side, this is a bolt stop bolt release, but you can push up on it, pull the charging handle to the rear and lock it open on this model, and then push down on it with your finger. Once you have a loaded magazine in it with the bolt to the rear, it will go home and chamber around. This is a non-reciprocating charging handle. This one you know, protrudes from the receiver. There are other variations that this would fold for convenience, some of the paratrooper models and stuff like that. On the right-hand side of the receiver, we have the optional carrying handle. Some models obviously would not have this. And then we have our magazine release right here, which the user can push forward and drop the magazine out of the weapon. For a piston, <clears throat> we have a short stroke gas piston in the rifle. And right here by my thumb is where you would adjust the gas settings. You'll tune the rifle to the ammunition that you're using. On top, we have a simple post, front sight, again, adjustable for elevation. Out front, we have the gas piston plug, which you can easily take off the rifle. Sling swivel, and then we have a very uh, prolific, once again, birdcage flash suppressor on the end of this particular rifle. And this is known as the 50.0 match. So let's do a little bit of shooting with this rifle, and then uh, let's get into the field stripping of the two guns and how they differ quite a bit and how that's accomplished. To load the FAL, it uses a standard 20 round magazine. Uh, there would be other magazines made available for the rifle. I've seen them in 30 round configurations and some other stuff like that that would come along later. But this is a standard FAL metric rifle. There would also be another rifle, which we'll do a video on if you guys would like, which is the inch pattern. And um, this is a metric, so there are different variations of the rifle that I'd mentioned. Uh, one is a pretty big difference, that being the, the inch pattern versus the metric. But let's go ahead and load the weapon. Now you can lock the bolt to the rear, as I'd mentioned earlier. Just push up on this and pull the charging handle to the rear, and that will lock the bolt open. You can insert the magazine, just like the M14. You have a, a toe on the front and a locking lug in the rear, so it's a rock and lock. You put it in and rock it up. In my experience, this rifle is much easier to load than the M14. You don't goof around and, and as much as you do with the M14 struggling to get the magazine in there. Now, I know some of you guys watching are going to say, I don't have any problems with my M14 or M1A. Well, some people do. So this one, in my mind, is a little bit easier to load. Now, to drop the bolt, the same lever that I pushed up on to lock it open, I'm now going to pull down on it with my thumb, and it will chamber that first round. Now, the selector lever on this rifle is right by the, th the shooter's thumb. But even while I have the rifle in my shoulder with my large hands and long thumb, I have to break my grip to switch it to fire. Typically, when I'm shooting off a rest, I will reach up with my left hand thumb, put it on fire, then put my hand out on the fore, fore end. So it's not all that easy to get to. The M14 definitely has an advantage there in my mind how quickly you can get the safety off. All right. I already have it in fire. All right, let's go for the 250, see what we can do out there at this bad boy. Find my dope here. I think I'm hitting right. Definitely low, here we go. Yep, left shoulder's where I gotta aim. Eyes are watering, we got that brisk breeze right in my face. Ah, darn 
eyes are watering. Oh. So once I found my hold for 250, uh, I actually shoot the FAL better. The two rifles using American Eagle Federal Ammunition, which is 150 grain ball load. Both these rifles shoot three MOA, three and a half MOA at 100 yards. Neither one of them I would consider to be match rifles. Now you'll see a lot of arguments online as to which one's more accurate. If you go back and take a look at one of the reasons why the U.S. military moved away from the M14 was because in the jungles of Vietnam, the wooden stocks would swell and screw with the point of impact. Now that was easily remedied later, either by the use of a synthetic stock or in the case of match rifles, they would glass bed the action, which would stabilize that wood so it couldn't affect the point of impact. The FAL has a very light profile barrel, as does the M14 which was done to save weight with those light profile barrels. It's very easy to influence that point of impact by applying pressure, uh, especially in the case of this rifle, to the foreign grip. If you bear down on it with a tight sling, just like an M16, you can actually start to affect your point of impact a little bit. So in terms of the two rifles and how they shoot, I don't know. I, I think the, uh, the FAL is a little bit more ergonomic for me and my frame. I definitely shoot it better than I do the M14. Let's disassemble the FAL and see how it, it comes apart. Now, we're just going to cover basic field maintenance. We're not going to go into full disassembly of the rifle. First, you're going to start off by making sure, in this case, weapon's on safe. You can use your index finger, push forward on the magazine release button. It will eject the magazine from the rifle. Pull the bolts to the rear, inspect the chamber, and the weapon is clear and ready for disassembly. As I previously mentioned, we have a disassembly lever here, which we're going to push up on. Uh, alternatively, there are variations of the rifle that have a disassembly here, lever here, which you'll pull back and it'll accomplish the same thing, which is breaking the action open. It will hinge open. Unlike the M16, you don't have a push pin with a detent. It actually requires the use of tools to separate the upper from the lower, so it's not part of a regular field maintenance. Next, I'm going to pull the top cover off, which is just a simple sheet metal stamping, and that exposes the bolt carrier and this little rod. This rod engages with a recoil spring housed in the buttstock. So when I close the upper and lower, you can see how the rod automatically aligns itself with that spring and how that now works. Very simple. So to remove the bolt and carrier, I'm going to grab this rod and pull them out the rear. You don't have to do anything else to the rest of the rifle from there. To remove the bolt from the carrier, you can pull it rearward, push in on the firing pin, which has a heavy spring on it, and rotate the bolt up and out of the carrier, which I struggle with. I don't know why, but I do. There we go. And I've separated the two. And that's all the further you really need to go. Putting the rifle back together is just simply reversing the disassembly process. But I want to show you guys how the locking mechanism works on the FAL. It's, it's ingenious in its simplicity. So this is the bolt outside of its carrier. Inside here, there's a little shelf, and this is the locking shelf. I'm going to hinge the action open, and I'm going to set the bolt. And when you push it forward, you'll see the rear end of the bolt drop down. See how it dropped down? That's the locking shelf. When the gas piston pushes back on the carrier, it's going to tap it right here on the face of the carrier. And when it does that, it's going to push that carrier rearward, which will then draw the bolt up out of its locking rec recess and pull it to the rear. Very simple design. All right, let's put it back together. Take your bolt carrier and your bolt. This is your locking surface on the bolt, so make sure it's facing down. Put it in, push, and it goes back together. You have rails on both sides of the carrier that ride inside rails in the receiver, obviously. I'm gonna push that bolt forward. I find that it's a little bit easier if you tilt it down so that bolt stays forward. Put the carrier and its receiver rails and just let it go forward. You're going to have to help it up over right there and then it closes. The top cover has very fine rails inside the receiver. You can set it in there about right here, line it up in the rear and then push it forward. Close your action and the weapon is reassembled. Very simple.
Let's field strip the M14. One thing I want to point out, as I forgot to mention it earlier, the M14, the actual service rifle, would have a, a notch cut out here in the stock, and that's where your uh, selector lever would be for semi-automatic and fully automatic fire. It was not uncommon to find that the fully automatic capabilities of the M14 would be disabled because uh, the rifles really are fairly hard to control on full auto. It takes a very um, good shooter to maintain control of the weapon in full auto fire, and that's true of the FAL as well. So you would find many times the FAL would be issued to troops without the select fire capability. All right, to disassemble the M14, we're going to go ahead and remove the magazine. The magazine's kind of like an AK, has a little tab, just grab it with your thumb and rock that magazine out of the weapon. Grab the charging handle, pull it to the rear, and make sure that chamber's empty. And now you can begin the disassembly process of the rifle. I'm gonna go ahead and invert the rifle. And on the trigger guard, you're gonna see a hole right there. And that hole is about the same diameter as the tip of a bullet. That's because you can use the bullet as a tool to pry that trigger guard off its perch there. Once you've done that, just simply pull up on the trigger guard and it will come out of the weapon. Rotate the rifle over, grab it by the rear sight, and now we're gonna lift the receiver out of the stock, just kind of wiggle it, it'll pop out, and then take it off the front here. We have a sheet metal tab that's cupping the front end of the stock, push it forward, and it comes out of the stock. Gonna set that stock aside. Now let's take a look at the action of the weapon while we have it uh, out of its stock. Here's your gas system on the rifle, and you have a short stroke piston in there as well. You can see that piston coming out. So when the gun fires, that piston will tap this op rod, which will then drive the bolt and op rod to the rear, cycling the weapon. Very simple design. To take it apart, here's your recoil spring and guide rod, and there's a little tab here. So what I'm going to do is relieve the spring pressure by pulling forward on it, and then I can move that little tab to one side and remove the guide rod and recoil spring. Now you pull the charging handle to the rear. There's a little cutout in the receiver just underneath the rear drum on the right-hand side of the receiver. And you want to line up the rear of the charging handle with that cutout notch and then lift up, and that will disassemble the, or re separate, I should say, the bolt from the rod. Push it forward, get that bolt out of the way, kind of wiggle the op rod out of the rifle like that. Now we need to get the bolt out of the gun. It's a simple rotating bolt. It locks by going forward and it drops down into that locking recess, so it locks on two sides. This mechanism would be copied by the AK-47. All right, so I'm gonna kinda rotate the bolt. And take it out of the receiver. Okay, you have a little roller here and that roller rides inside the charging handle. This reduces friction. All right, to put it, put it back together, you just reverse the process, put the bolt in, bring it to the rear, set it up so that you can take your op rod, put it in this op rod guide right here, push it forward until it starts to move forward, get the bolt to the rear, line up the disassembly tab on the receiver there, and then push them forward. Take your recoil spring and guide rod. Now it's important to note that this guide rod is part of the magazine system. As I mentioned earlier, this will engage with the front of the magazine when it locks into place. So you put your recoil spring in, make sure that little pin is across, and compress it. Hold on to it because you can send it sailing very easily and push that pin across. Now you can see how the magazine interfaces, oops, let me line everything up here, how it interfaces with that op rod in the front. Okay, let's put it back together. Put the front of your assembly there on the front of the stock and just rotate it back, lining up the lugs here with the stock. Rotate it over, take your fire control group, set it inside, pull the trigger guard back until it clicks, and the weapon is reassembled. The M14 is about as American as you can get. It's a 
classic rifle and it's a beautiful rifle and it's a lot of fun to shoot. As I'd mentioned earlier in the video, the rifles, both of them with the 150 grain American Eagle ball out here, um, they'll, they'll shoot groups about that big at 100 yards. I mean, they're three, four MOA guns at, at 100 yards with just average ammunition. So they're pretty evenly matched in my experience in terms of accuracy. I do shoot the FAL a little bit better than I shoot the M14, but it does not take away from the fact that this rifle is a lot of fun to shoot. However, if, I would, if I'm looking for an infantry rifle, the M14 would be pretty low on my list of rifles I would choose. There's a number of reasons for that. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, the poor thing was obsolete the day it entered service in 1959, and that's why it is remembered as one of America's shortest serving primary infantry rifles. Yes, the rifle still continue, continues on in service today, but not as a primary issued service rifle. It's filling a hole that needed to be filled in our ongoing wars in the Middle East, and they're pretty much the soldiers are carrying it because of the caliber, not because the design uh, isn't bested by more modern designs. That means, in my opinion, the FAL is the superior infantry rifle. Had the United States adopted this rifle in 1953 or 1959 when they adopted the M14, it would probably have gone on in military service until the 80s sometime, just like our allies. They continued to use this rifle even though we transitioned over to the M16 and the 5.56 caliber, and that goes to that story where we kind of screwed over our NATO allies a couple of times in choosing the M14 and then later choosing the M16. The rifles are pretty much the same length and same weight, at least this particular version of the FAL. But to me, the ease of disassembly, the more modern controls in the pistol grip, the polymer furniture, the FAL is just a more advanced rifle and it should, in my opinion, have won the military trials in which the United States unfortunately picked the M14. Now I know that's gonna set off a firestorm of comments down below the video, but you know, everybody has an opinion and that's mine. The FAL, in my mind, is the better of the two rifles. All right, guys, if you'd like to support us here at the Military Arms Channel, the best way to do that is to become a Patreon supporter. We do have a link down below. Give that link a click, check it out, and consider supporting us here at the Military Arms Channel. Another way you can do that is just below the video player, you're gonna see a join button. That's both on your mobile device and your desktop. Click that join button and consider becoming part of our YouTube membership family. And last but not least, please be sure to swing by and check out coppercustom.com. Guys, thanks for 12 years of support. I look forward to the flaming comments down below. We'll talk to you all soon.